Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm very excited. I have Dr. Glenn Livingston, who's the founder of the International Coach Certification Academy. He has more experience in both coaching and business development than the founders of virtually any other coach certification program on the planet. And together with his wife, Dr. Sharon Livingston, who is also his co-founder, they have sold over $30 million in consulting services to major brands like AT&T, American Express, L'Oreal, and many more. And they are among the few marketing psychologists that billion-dollar companies have used to crawl deep inside their prospects' minds and uncover exactly what customers were desperate to buy and how to improve profits on existing product lines. Uh, we all need that. He also runs a high-end coaching practice that's routinely sold out. Dr. Glenn, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Jeremy, let me just ask you, do you want to do that again because my stupid yeah. outlook had a reminder? I closed it now. Okay. No, let's just, let's just Sorry. roll with it because you have limited time and I don't want to waste another minute uh, on something like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm excited to hear your big lessons and thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. But thank you for having me. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Um, and I have to ask, you know, I want to get into your background, what some of your inspirations were growing up in, and what led you to your career. But I have to ask about this, um, the billion dollar companies you work with, what were some of the big takeaways? Um, well, you know, some of the, well, one of the biggest takeaways was that I don't care how much money you pay me, I'm not flying to Tokyo and back for a one hour meeting. <laughs> that's, that, that, that's probably the biggest takeaway. But, but, um, Jay Abraham once said that something which has, which, which seems to be commonplace in one industry can have the impact of an atom bomb in another. Hmm. And that's actually how I made my name in the internet marketing field. Um, People were doing surveys and just asking people what they wanted and then working it out to give it to them, which I think is good advice. But they didn't really understand how to interpret the survey in the best way. And mm -hmm. in the marketing research world, the goal is really between the survey questions, not in the question themselves. So what, what that means is if I give you five choices and I ask you what's the most important thing you're looking for about your pet guinea pig today mm – -hmm. And there are five possible answers. Well, it's important to know what the most important thing is, but it's even more important to know where are the pockets of highly unusual response. Do women over 40 um, answer that question much differently than the rest of the population? Mm -hmm. And in marketing research, there's a whole set of standards for isolating and identifying those pockets of response and you know, looking for those hyper-responsive um, targets and then speaking to them with exactly what's for them. And nobody was doing that in the marketing world. They still mostly don't do it. Ryan, Ryan Levesque does it. Yes, um, he does. Yeah. He learns from the best, stuff. apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope so. I don't, you know, here's, here's an interesting thing. I don't even know that I'm the best. I'm the guy who decided to narrate the story. Okay. I'm the guy who said they're doing it over here, but they're not doing it over yeah. there. Let let me you know let me bring the ship over to the internet marketing world and mm -hmm. I got that reputation I got to be first in the customer's mind for for doing that and that's how I got um, my position in the internet marketing yeah. world and I I think there's a lesson in that I th I think that you know you don't have to be you don't have to be the inventor of the idea you only have to be the retailer of idea Abraham Lincoln mm -hmm. said that and you don't have to be the the best or have the most market share, you just kind of need to be the guy that does it or the, the gal that does it. Yeah. I mean, I think you're being slightly humble because your background is a researcher. I mean, you were a PhD. And so what what unusual stuff did you find? You were just mentioning about the, the questions, the surveys, and some of the unusual hyper-responsive answers. What were some unusual uh, things that you have seen? Um. I, I'm not sure I quite understand the question. You mean in the particular industries that I research? Yeah, yeah. Like in, a, if you give an example, of like one of the the research, uh, some of the research you did, and like a hyper, -resp like a maybe an outlier, like you were saying. Oh, I, I mean, s simple things like surveying a large pharmaceutical companies, um, large pharmaceutical supply houses, customer base, and discovering that all of the sales for one particular product were coming from, let's just say San Diego, I have to disguise a little bit. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And they had thought it was distributed 
nationwide and then they just never really bothered to do that analysis and mm. they're all coming from San Diego and then you dig in and find out well what is it about the right. in San Diego what are they saying and how we're going to get that over to the rest of the world and it, it's that kind of thing and, and, and then mm. you figure out how to disseminate that knowledge and yeah. make the rest of the business hum. That's really important. So what was it about quote unquote San Diego that uh... you, you're asking me questions that I can't answer? Okay. Because, because I have to ask, a, but yeah, that's, nice. that's okay. I, I understand. Um, so tell me about uh, where you're from. What was it like growing up? Some of the big influences early on. I know you come from a big family of psychologists and social workers, counselors. I do. I do. Um, well, you know, I suppose the best way to say this is when I was five years old, um, we had a show and tell in in kindergarten, and they asked me what my dad did, and I had heard my dad on my dad was on the radio quite a bit, and I said, well, my dad's a psychologist, and they say, well, what does that mean? And I said, well, he makes people happy when they're sad, and ever since I can remember, that's what I wanted to do. I I I would put people on the couch my, my friends would come over and we'd play shrink and i put them couch on the couch and i'd tell them to lie down and tell me about the mother and i'd say what's the matter and why are you so unhappy <laughs> <laughs> um you know and i think that's my primary motivation in life although yeah. as i matured i came to understand that being content is a better goal than being happy you can't you can't be happy all the time unless you take drugs and eat chocolate all day long um but you can be content if you if you learn to deal with reality and mm -hmm except that there's a certain amount of hard work in life and nevertheless work efficiently and strive towards your passions and your goals. You can be, you can be very, very content. You can live without um, the bulk of neuroses and psychoses that most of us live with. And you can run a sane and enjoyable business with that philosophy. So I, I think that that early upbringing, um, you know, with parents who were psychologist and focus on what you were feeling and wanted you to be happy a lot of the time. I, I think that that really influenced me to try to drive contentment later on in everything that I did. And maybe that's the best answer to that question. Yeah, that's interesting. So what do you tell people who maybe aren't content some of your secrets to get to that point? Um, well, contentment largely has to do with accepting reality. You know, that you... You can't influence reality unless you accept reality. And I, and I find that the largest group of, well, these days I work with coaches and entrepreneurs, hmm. the biggest problem that they have is they're just looking for some way to get away from reality. And everybody say, oh, no, 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 that's not me. That doesn't describe me. But why then is everybody out buying the latest traffic technique right. when what what really works to build a business is ask people what they want, find ways of reaching it, reaching them, give it to them, stay in the game until you win the game, keep on, keep on buying traffic, keep on doing your joint ventures, keep on testing, keep on, keep on failing if you need to, and just go, 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 go until it works. The name of the game is staying in the game until you win the game. But what everybody is so distracted by is the latest shiny object. And the yeah. reason for that is that it's so hard to accept what reality really is. And reality is that business is hard and um, it's worthwhile. It's, it's better than the alternative. It's better than working for someone else, but it's hard. And um, if you, you know, dig in and put your head down and do the work, it's, it's really the basics and the fundamentals that are going to serve you in the long run. Yeah. Um, but, you know, all, all of we entrepreneurs are always looking for that magic bullet and the quick fix. Yeah. I, I really haven't found one. I, I really haven't found a magic bullet. I, I've, I've found that the more that I just accept, that it's about those fundamentals and about working hard, the, the better I do. Mm -hmm. So what did you, you always wanted to be a psychologist. What did the early days of your career look like? Well, I, I never thought about being a marketer. The, the only inkling of marketing in my early days really has to do with the fact that it bothered me that as a psychologist, you were kind of like a small country doctor. You, mm -hmm. you could influence a small group of people because most, the model for I was brought up by psychoanalysts, and I was kind of moving in that direction. And the model, this was in the 60s and 70s, so mm. it was more in vogue than it is now. And the model for that was that you had a small group of patients who really wanted to work hard at understanding their soul and work through their neuroses and, and psychoses. And, and so maybe most psychoanalysts would have 
40 or 50 patients that have a small practice mm -hmm. and largely they would, be, they would be the same people. There would be a couple of people that floated in and out over the years and they would make a good living and make a difference for those people and their families. Mm -hmm. But that would be it. And in the early part of my life, because I saw my father doing that and I thought it was a really worthwhile life, I thought I would really like to influence the world on a deeper basis. I, I studied so hard. I studied so hard to get the knowledge that I had. And it's a long it haul getting a PhD, yeah. It was nine years. Yeah. I mean, with, with college and graduate school and all the other dissertation and everything. And, and I really wanted to make a difference on a grander scale. So I had that inkling that there was something inside of me that had to be a marketer. And I, mm -hmm. you know, was developing. I was going about it entirely the wrong way back then. But um, in, the, in the early days, I really wanted to be a psychoanalyst. And I read all the books. And I... Um, you know, got all the practice that I could and I hired all the supervisors that I could afford and went to all the seminars that I could and, um, you know, I became, I became a pretty darn good psychoanalyst, if I do say so myself, but it really wasn't, um, it wasn't enough for me. So where did you get your it, first breakthrough, your marketing breakthrough? Um, probably marrying Sharon. Okay. Sh Sharon actually trained to be a psychologist just like me, but in order to pay for graduate school, she took a job at Gray Advertising. And in Gray Advertising, there were only a handful of focus group moderators back then. And one of the one of the projects she was assigned to, the moderator was not doing such a great job. And so she looked at the boss and she said, could I go in and do that? And she did, and everybody loved it. And about a year later, I think, she said, you know, I think I'm going to go out on my own and would you send me some clients and um and it worked and she her business took off like lightning she actually left graduate school at the time and didn't get her phd for another 15 years wow. um, because she had you know before she knew it she had a million dollar business and and um and so when we were friends for seven years um but during that time i knew about her and her business and then when she got divorced and i didn't have a girlfriend we got together. The and stars she, aligned. The stars aligned. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, but all of a sudden, you know, she specialized in uncovering the psychological purchase motivation, the, the like more deeply held mm -hmm. thoughts and feelings that people couldn't articulate directly. So she came up with all these, they're called projective techniques. Mm -hmm. they're, they're really essentially games that got consumers talking about things they wouldn't normally talk about. And it was very popular. But the problem with that was that there were many large companies who weren't willing to stake a $50 million advertising campaign on that kind of qualitative data, right? right? They want specific numbers or something. They wanted like numbers. Yeah. And the problem with coming up with numbers was that you would typically revert to just asking directly. So you'd say, well, do you use the American Express card because it, A, gives you more status, B, makes you feel important, and, you know, C, I'm going to slap you in the face, which is <laughs> the prospects would feel. You can't, you can't ask those kind of questions directly. These are um, unconscious or preconscious processes that, right. that are going on. And so what I had to do was this design a set of, I, I had studied, um, I, had, I had been asked to teach a graduate laboratory in graduate school called the Multivariate Analysis of Human Behavior. Mm -hmm. And which was a fancy way of saying, how do you get the soul into the machine? How do you take observations without asking people and then infer what's making them tick by correlations and factor analyses and all these types of inferential statistics? Right. And so I started applying that to what Sharon was doing. I came up with all these models of observation and inf inference. And that was my big break into the marketing world. And, um, you know, to this day, that's probably where I've been paid the most money for my expertise. And it was very, it was, the work itself was very intriguing. I didn't like flying. And I think I told you that I was asked to go to Japan and back for one hour meeting. And that was kind of the, the ultimate moment when I said, I'm not doing this anymore. Um, so I didn't like flying. I didn't like the politics. You could work. We had a million dollar project, spent a year of lives executing it. We're really proud we could actually pull it together. And in the end, it all got boiled to one page that went to the CEO's desk and he went, Whoa. eh, I, said, I, I don't think I'm going to do it. And I said, you know what? My life means more than that. And I, 
Um, even though they're going to give us a lot of money for this, I'm just not going to pursue that mm -hmm. kind of thing. So, but that was my entree into marketing, and I would be a lot richer if I stayed there. But uh, not happy or content. Not content, right? Sure. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Kind of going back to the upbringing I had. So. So, what was the next big milestone that you had in your career? Well. It wasn't really a positive milestone. It's maybe a blessing in disguise in retrospect, yeah. but okay. So remember, I didn't have kids and I didn't commute. I ne I've never had children. I never commuted. Um, I'm a little sorry about the first one and I'm not sorry at all about the second one. Mm -hmm. But I had a lot of time. And so I actually, I developed a 65 person country doctor practice on Long Island, working with couples and families and, you know, seeing a lot of small boys, which was a lot of fun. And during that time, I was running these corporate projects, but I didn't like Sharon traveling either. So I I'd decided I wasn't going to travel, and I didn't want her traveling anymore either. And mm -hmm. there are two ends of the marketing research industry. There's the intellectual capital end, which is where we always were. We designed projects, we executed the projects, and we advised the clients on what they should do with the results. Mm -hmm. And then there was the recruiting and screening and hosting end of the industry where you would put together a big facility with one-way mirrors and you'd have a bank of telemarketers. Mm, yeah, yeah. And so I said, Sharon, what, why don't we just go into the other half of the industry? You know, we've been doing this for all this time. You know the industry better than anybody else. Why don't we just do that? And that wasn't such a bad idea, but the, the problem was we... I'd never failed in anything before. My, my practice took off, you know, like that. My, my, you know, as soon as I was out of graduate school, I remember the week after graduate school, I sold this $50,000 marketing project. Mm. And Sharon and I felt like we just had the Midas touch and we were golden and nothing could ever go wrong. And we didn't realize that, look, we trained for nine years. You know, we trained for all these right. years as psychologists. Yeah. We didn't know anything about that side of the industry. And man, did we fail. I mean, we just, we're getting a little bit of traction, but we, we chose the wrong location. We didn't do any research. It was in New York. Um, I mean, 9-11 really wasn't our fault, but that was the nail in the coffin. And we had just invested everything. We had $150,000 a month of you know, expenses and payroll and everything well, like that. And, yeah. and then people just stopped coming after the planes crashed. And um, I'd never lost so much money so quickly, and I couldn't believe how much in debt we were. And it was... Um, really was a nightmare I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. Um, That's tough, yeah. It, it was not fun. It, it, it was not fun. I, I always say, I, lose, I lost $2 million and I didn't have $2 million and I didn't, you know, like if you lose your car keys, you have to have your car keys first before you lose your car keys, but right. you, you can lose money without having it first and that, that was kind of a shock. Sure. <laughs> um, and, and so, anyway, so, I had both Sharon and I had told our practices, me, my clinical practice, and she, her consulting practice, that we were not going to do consulting anymore. So I, I took, told all my patients I was on sabbatical. I gave up that income. Um, and you generally don't get patients back after you tell them you're on sabbatical. And Sharon did the same thing with all of her clients. And so here we were, um, you know, very skilled, degreed people with no income. And seven hundred thousand dollars in debt, and um, you know, still a hefty monthly bill even after we close the the facility. And so, I said, "Well, what do I know best? Where am I likely to make the most money?" And it was in applying. I, I asked myself, "What do people pay me the most for?" They paid me for the marketing research work that I did um, with all these fancy protocols. And I said, "Okay, well, why not just?" Why don't I just see if I can apply that to the internet? And instead of having all these clients, because I don't want Sharon to travel anymore, I don't want, I want myself to travel anymore, why don't we just do it for ourselves? Mm -hmm. And I'd heard about, of all things, the underachiever model back then, where you would survey people, ask them what they want, and then go out and have a book written all about what they wanted. And then just, you know, if they said, I want to know how to... I want to know how to get my computer to boot up faster. You'd write a book called How to Get Your Computer to Boot Up 400 Times Faster. And I used the fancy techniques for analyzing the surveys that I had learned in the marketing research arena. 
And I was very, very successful fairly quickly. Not, not immediately, but fairly quickly. Um, there was actually there were a couple of pivotal coaches I got in the mix there that gave me some insights I didn't really understand about direct marketing at the time. What did they tell you? Who were they? Um, well, it was mostly about copywriting. Mm-hmm. I, I was still very professorial in those days. And that meant I was teaching and educating people about the facts as opposed to telling stories and really talking about the benefits. And the other insight was that as a healthcare professional, well, you're a healthcare professional too, so you should yeah. appreciate this. We're really motivated to sell prevention. Like, I mean, especially as a chiropractor, right? You must, right. Yeah. You, know, you must look at everyone and say, you know, dude, if you would stretch and work on your core. <laughs> you don't have to see me, right? <laughs> right, <laughs> right. And, and I would look at people and say, you know, if you would just develop some frustration tolerance, and if you take responsibility for your communications as opposed to blaming everybody else, then the problems you're having with your wife, the problems you're having with your son, your trouble at work, it would all just go away. But you can't sell that. That's mm-hmm. people, people don't want to buy improved frustration tolerance. Right. They, what they want to buy is, I want my wife to stop being an idiot. <laughs> or I want my son to get better grades. Right, yeah. Right? And, and those were the insights that I got from, um, it was Jonathan Mizell and Perry Marshall were the two coaches mm-hmm. that I worked with way back when. And then later on, Terry Dean. Um, and they kind of had to beat out of me this professorial bent mm-hmm. and the healthcare professional's desire to self prevention as opposed to cure. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then you feel guilty selling the cure also because you you can't lie to these people, right? So you, you have to you have to figure out how to sell to the lizard brain without seeming like a lizard. Mm-hmm. And that was a really difficult thing for me to get. So I think that that's why there was a year or so where I was still suffering before I kind of put it all together. Um, and I find that most healthcare professionals, you can't talk them out of that. Most healthcare professionals, it's, it's the rare healthcare professional that I can make into a good marketer because it's just, you know, when you spend nine years in school getting a doctorate, um, you think this is how the world is and this is what you have to do. And you don't realize that if you can't sell those services or tapes about those services or, you know, coaching programs about those services, then those services are actually going to waste. Mm-hmm. And so it's actually more ethical to learn how to sell like this than to step back and say, well, you know, I guess I'm always just going to be a reasonably unsuccessful small country doctor because I don't know how to sell this. Um, yeah. you know, if, you, if you really have a cure, then I think it's, I think it's um, incumbent upon you to figure out how to reach the most people with that cure. And I generally make a lot of health professionals angry when I talk to talk to them like that. But um, I really believe that. Yeah, I don't see how that would make someone angry. I can kind of see if there's a certain mindset. But uh, so where did you start? What uh, niches did you decide to go into at that point? Oh, well, okay, I didn't have any money. <laughs> so, remember, I was $700,000 in debt. And right. so I could I couldn't go into finance and, you know, buy advertising that was going to cost me two or three bucks or five bucks a click. I went into um, publishing little books about guinea pigs and rabbits. And and I, I, I was interested in perfecting the research and publishing formula more so than any particular mm-hmm. niche. So mm-hmm. I like animals. So I went through a bunch of animals. I yeah. and then went on to alpacas. Which really? Was, yeah. I had this written down because I wanted to make sure we did not glaze over this. I wrote how to care, you had how to care for pet guinea pigs, rabbits, frogs, and even goats. Yeah, I do. And you did well with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think we sold one hundred and fifty thousand dollars of guinea pig books, ten dollars at a time, and something similar That's for amazing. rabbits. And, yeah. Um, I actually. I only took those off the market because I just didn't have time to manage it. And I really should have assigned someone to do that. It would right. probably still be profitable today. But we did really well. On, um, That's a lot of $10 ebooks and audios. What did you do to sell them? Um, well, just what I've been talking about. We, mm-hmm. we would ask people. We would put up an ad that said everything you want to know about pet guinea pigs all in one place. 
and they would click on the link and they would see a survey that said, um, hey, I'm writing a book about pet guinea pigs and I want to make sure I don't leave anything out. That's why I need your help. If you're willing to answer this short survey, then I will be more than happy to give you a copy of the book. And then I'll have a couple of questions. So the standard one, which came from the underachiever model, was what's the most important thing you need to know about guinea pigs? But then I'd also ask people, why do you need to know that? Um, because it was different if it was a mom looking, and this is one of the key insights from my marketing research days, is you didn't want to know just what people want to know, you want to know why they want to know it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because they might say, well, I want to know how long do guinea pigs live? And <clears throat> that gives you some information about how to sell to them, but you would sell to them very differently if you know that it's a kid searching to find out for a school project versus it's a mom searching because her, <clears throat> excuse me, I got a little. They don't right. want to kill it so that they have to tell the kid it died. <laughs> well, no, it, no, oh. be, be, if it's a mom searching because they're, they bought their kid a pet hamster and that pet hamster only lived for six months and that was devastating. Right, right, yeah. Right. And so if, if you know that about the searcher and then you turn around and you say, you know, get your son a guinea pig so that they can have a loving, nurturing experience with a real animal that lives for up to eight years if you do it right. That's a much more powerful marketing statement than, mm -hmm. um, you know, gee, guinea pigs live eight years. Mm -hmm, yeah. Right? And it also gives you a sense of which benefits to focus on and where's the real emotional pain. So I would ask people why. I would ask people um, how difficult it was to find that information elsewhere because I don't want to put a whole book or product together if they can find free information about how to solve that problem on Google, you know, in the first organic link, mm -hmm. they're unlikely to buy it if it's not a market gap in some way. So I was searching for market gaps. I was searching for emotional pain and market gaps. And I would look for people who answered a lot of information or really engaged with the survey. So it was one thing if they said, well, I want to know how long guinea pigs live. And it was another if they said, I want to know how long guinea pigs live and do South American guinea pigs live, live longer than, you know, Eastern European guinea pigs. And, you know, my friend had this one guinea pig and, and they would just tell you the they whole life story. On. Yeah. And the reason, Jeremy, that was important was because I found that when there were market gaps, people would engage with the survey more. Because if you think about it, if you can find the answer you want somewhere else in this in Google as you're searching, then why would you take all this time to answer my question and then have to wait to get the answer in a book? Mm -hmm. So That's there nice. were all these markers. There were all these indicators of opportunity and responsiveness and mm -hmm. put them all together in a big score. And then I would isolate what I called the point of difference benefits. And um, I'd go out and I'd hire a writer to write a book. And then in the meantime, I'd write a sales letter based upon what everybody wanted. And I would then turn that into an opt-in page and, um, and write a whole bunch of follow-ups and we'd sell these books and, you know, we'd make like two to one doing that. That's great. That's pretty, pretty consistent across a bunch yeah. of niches. So what was next? What was the, the next big milestone for you? Um, well, I wasn't going to develop a real business. I mean, it's kind of interesting. Because I've, you know, I've run a million and sometimes multi-million dollar business, you know, since I was 27 years old, right? Yeah. But I still wasn't really a business person. I was really more like a very high-end doctor selling my consulting time. And I didn't really understand what was necessary to run a publishing business. I didn't really understand the information marketing world. I didn't understand... I understood how to be a coach and how to supervise other coaches, but I didn't really understand how to market a coaching practice and how to, how to, well, I know how to market a single coaching practice, but I didn't know how to market an academy that taught other people to do that as a whole business. Mm -hmm. So the, the next milestone for me was realizing that this was a ridiculous model. For some reason, I thought I was going to then, well, why don't I put together a hundred little niches like you know, guinea pigs and frogs and goats and Sudoku and radon and alpacas and body language and frogs. And I mean, I just went on and on and on. And some of them would make a few hundred dollars a month and some of them would make, you know, $10,000 a month. But there was no way 
to really manage all that. I suppose now I could do it if I put a bunch of people in place, but um, there's a lot to manage. And so I was looking for something to focus on. Yeah. And then I actually hired Perry Marshall as a coach, and he yeah. said, "Well, why don't you just teach people how to do it instead? You know, you're obviously successful. There are not a lot of people who are out there teaching who've done anything besides." just say that they can help you make money but you've actually gone and made money doing things that have nothing to do with making money why don't you just teach this instead and um, and he asked me to speak at his seminar and this was his first seminar back in 2006 his AdWords seminar yeah. and I said okay I'll tell everybody what I'm doing with AdWords and um, he said well you should probably sell something afterwards and, and I said well how about if I do a weekend seminar and he said, sure. He said, you should charge $4,000 for it. And I told him he was crazy. Um, I said, who's going to pay $4,000 to learn how to sell guinea pig bucks? And there was a bunch of people that came running up at the end of that seminar and whipped out a credit card and gave me four grand to sell, to learn how to do that, um, which was revelatory to me. I really didn't understand that people would pay that much to learn. I didn't, didn't understand that it was that valuable. Um, now it turned out I, I gave all that money back because I felt guilty about it. Which why? Um, I just I kind of felt like it was going to be a scam. I, I kind of felt like I wasn't positive everybody else could do it at that time, and they wouldn't get their money's worth out of it. I don't know. I just I, I felt guilty taking that much money from individuals. It's yeah. no big deal if Bausch and Lomb wants to give me a million dollars for a project, but I knew some of these people were giving me their last dollar, and right. I, I gave it all back. Um, and I conducted the seminar for free, and they all told me that I should have kept their money. <laughs> they didn't give it to me again. but <laughs> <laughs> um, And so then I said, okay, you know what? I'll charge $1,500 for the product. And, um, and so I recorded the seminar, and I wrote a sales letter for that, and I sold about 1,500 of those $1,500 products. Wow. Um, over over several years. That's great, yeah. And that became an interesting business in and of itself. But what was still happening, I, now I did have an implementation rate, um, which I think was a little bit higher than what most people have, mm -hmm. but it still wasn't that high and I wasn't happy with it. And people were asking me really for done-for-you services. Mm -hmm. And so the next milestone was trying to start an agency well, I mean, we did start an agency and it grew to 21 people relatively quickly, but I, I hired a partner and, you know, I had a lot of partners at that time and I really didn't assess the, um, their needs versus my needs um, and their interests versus my interests. We just kind of jumped in and said, wow, you know, we have all these clients and, you know, I could write a sales letter and get you a hundred clients tomorrow. And mm -hmm. um, that was kind of a painful learning experience because it was one thing to sell them and it was another thing to deliver it. And, yeah. Another thing to run it, and so so that agency Rocky Clicks is still in existence. They're very they're very very good. They're they're very good if they'll if they'll accept you. Um, but you know, but I I sold out of that in 2011 um, because we really wanted to go in different directions. Jeff and I are still very friendly, but we wanted to go in different directions. And right around that time, I started realizing that you know what. My business is only work. I had a whole bunch of other partners because I really thought my obstacle was I have this formula, but I don't have the time or bandwidth to execute it. Yeah. And what I found out was I took on all these partners at 50 50 with a 50 50 deal. And I found out that it doesn't work unless I can totally boss them around. It, there were just, there are a lot of marketing insights. People tend to think they know how to market, and there are things they, that are painful to, to learn and painful to do, and you kind of wish there was an easier way. And if they were 50-50 partners, I didn't really have the leverage to get them to do what was necessary. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there were other reasons that, you know, I didn't really have the time to have 11 partners. That was pretty stupid in and of itself. Um, you know, a lot of, I didn't, I never went for an MBA, so I kind of learned business the hard way. Um, but by 2011, I'd kind of figured that out and I was starting to exit all of those partnerships and say, you know what, I really need to be focusing on something for myself. And so um, and so I still had the teaching business for the marketing and I started doing more of my own business coaching to 
fill in the gap a little bit. And, um, and I kind of went back and I said, well, what's going to be, I have a lot of skills. If I put all my time into something, I know what's going to work. What do I really want to do? And mm. when it came down to it, what I really wanted to do was, um, was help the helper and train, train other people how to become coaches and bring contentment to other people in their lives. And, um, so we decided to open up a business and personal coaching academy, mm-hmm. train business and personal coaches. And that's what I've been well, I'm making it sound a little more simple and straightforward than it was. Um, it's not that easy, right? <laughs> well, n- no, because I, I, I'm competing against the International Coaching Federation and the Sylvan Learning Center and Tony Robbins and, you know, and um, just kind of going into the market without a real name in that market. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I really, there are a number of insights I could talk about that really yeah. worked for me. That, okay. Yeah. Talk about how you broke into the market. What were some of the insights? So obviously I did the survey research and we also do phone follow-ups when we do that, that I would normally do. And I, I took my time with that. I took six months doing that. And, and so uh, people can check it out too. Um, the domain is coachcertificationacademy.com. Is that well, right? that, that, that's the academy domain. The best okay. point, if you want to see how the marketing process works and also you want to learn more about coaching, yeah. would be the free materials at thecoachingtest.com or just coachingtest.com. Got it. Okay. And, and so, okay, here, here were some of, the, some of the insights that I really applied for the first time when I did this. Now, as a result of coaching a number of successful businesses myself, which is it's a really interesting thing to do, by the way, to be a business coach, because it's like getting free testing across a wide variety of markets. Right. Um, and it's also a place where you can observe and advise people without the pain of having to be the one who executes it yourself. And you have to be really careful that you give people things that are doable. Right. But um, I don't know if I would have develop the understanding if I hadn't developed the agency and seen all the dollars into dollars out results of different marketing campaigns and if I hadn't done all this business coaching I don't know that I would have developed the insights that allowed me to go into the coaching academy itself um, okay so what one of the things that I saw was that it was a competitive advantage to have a longer time horizon most people feel like they have to break even the first month or the first two months, no matter what. But if you're going to go into a ruthlessly competitive market on a global scale, the odds of breaking even in the first month or two early on in the game are minuscule. They they, they really are. There's just, there's too much to learn. And how can you really hope to overcome the millions of dollars of research that your competitors have put in, um, you know, to split testing and, you know, yes, there are all these marketing research techniques where you can take advantage of some of that, but in the end, you know, you have to have real customers and do real tests yourself to figure out what's going to work. And so, mm-hmm. I built a big spreadsheet and I put in every last variable: what was the lead generation rate? What was the conversion rate going to be? What is the upsell to this? What's the cross sell to that? What's the refund rate? What's the customer service? What are all the expenses? What's the credit card fee? What's the chargeback fee going to be? I just I built a gigantic spreadsheet, and I did a tremendous amount of cash flow modeling and scenario estimation, and that was extraordinarily helpful to me because it that gave me the map that I needed to see the progress and see where I was going when you know in the beginning it took me ten months to break even. Um, and so I knew that I was going to have to go forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars into the red to really stay in this market. And to be willing to do that, I, I, I don't think I would have been willing to do that if I didn't have that perspective and that mm-hmm. type of forecast in hand. And I, very, very, very few marketers do that. It's it's a lot of work, um, and it's a little scary when you're a lot you of discipline. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so I mean that's one of the things we teach in the business coaching academy now too, because we think it's a critical skill. But um, so that that was a key insight, and that worked, you know. And and now we're way beyond, you know, 
well, m most months we're profitable the first month and we're, um, we're virtually always profitable the second month. So we've really beaten that bug and we're building all these upsells now. And it's, I continue to do all that forecasting and rely on it for where we're going to go now. It's not as scary as it used to be because everything's working so well. Um, but that was a real critical insight. The um, other critical insight was that people really do buy credibility and authority. The buy, the really, the amount of proof you need in order to sell online is going up and up and up. Mm -hmm. And in markets where people are entering a profession, they also they they really do want they really do want you to be able to credentialize them. And I actually had to overcome my internal thinking about that because I've met so many coaches, so many psychotherapists for that matter, who are really, really much better than people who have PhDs, hmm. um, but they don't have a PhD. They just have a lot of real world experience and they're so much better. Mm -hmm. And I would send people to them in a heartbeat more so than a lot of the people I know with PhDs. Not, I also know some really good PhDs, yeah. but but I don't think that the PhD itself makes you a great psychologist and makes you a great coach. Mm -hmm. I think that it's your dedication. Yeah. Well, it's the immersion, right? It's it's yeah. it's the, it's the immersion with the clients and your dedication to getting supervision and how much you are willing to work on yourself and learn from every client and. Mm -hmm. You know, if this is really what you want to do. So, um, but I, I had to learn that it was necessary to sell that. That's really what people want. They've got a lot of insecurities in the beginning, and they 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 need that. They need a certification. They need us to look very credible, so they can point their clients to a credible organization, and mm -hmm. that's what they need. So, th those are really two of the biggest insights. Mm -hmm. So not only your credentials, but an actual pointing to, I got this certification from this organization. Because mm -hmm. you do a fantastic job. I mean, there's like a four-tiered page of you going through your credibility. Um, I, I remember I was reading, you know, your certifications, the press, you've been, like everything. There's like a whole page dedicated to that. Well, I think most marketers yeah. have proof-hiding yeah. disease. <laughs> I, 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 I think that most people that come to me for coaching mm – -hmm. I look at their sites and they've buried their most successful accomplishments deep on the about page or, you know, on page 17 of this blog category or something like that. And you have to remember that people are not looking for any old solution. They're looking for the best solution for them. And they, they really want a superhero to come rescue them from the problem. Mm -hmm. And if you're not willing to stick your chest out and stand up and say, look, I can perform heroic feats when it comes to this particular problem that I'm that you're looking to get help with, mm -hmm. then someone else is gonna. And, you know, so you need to amass all the proof you can so you can stick your chest out like that mm -hmm. and put it front and center. And every time I find, especially for high-end sales, that proof is everything. It means so much. Mm -hmm. Dr. Glenn, I know we have a few more minutes. Um, so I wanted to get, I want you to have, uh, have you talk about where people should check you out, what you're working on lately, but I also wanted to hear about your one of your proudest moments in your career. My proudest moment in my career. Yeah. Um. Well, you know, I I don't suppose you can be more proud of anything than saving a suicidal patient. Um, you know, and Tell I me about that, yeah. Well, I haven't done it for a long time. I, I haven't done it for a long time because I, um. I don't have the energy. I mean, it's really sad to say. I'm kind of embarrassed to say, but I never lost anybody. I saw a lot of suicidal people, and I I didn't lose any of them, but I lost a lot of sleep. Mm -hmm. um, but I felt like, you know, I was really I was really helping them and their families, and mm -hmm. um, you know, and it was very very challenging. It took everything that I had. I had to coordinate with my with my peers. I had to work with the treatment team and there's there's nothing more challenging or more rewarding that I've that I've ever done but there's also nothing more exhausting than I've ever done and that's why I really don't do it anymore I I, I never like I never turned down a call from anybody that I worked with previously but I don't take on any new patients and I don't take those kind of new calls anymore 
Yeah. Um, so I'd say if you're asking me man to man, what am I really most proud of? That's what it is. And I'm, yeah. I, I wish that I was one of those guys that had an enter, had the, had it in them to make a lifetime career out of that. But I, I, I just don't, I'm a little more selfish than that. Um, in, in business, what makes me proudest is it's funny that there was a, an interview between Bill Maher and John Cleese for Monty Python. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of a big Monty Python fan. Mm -hmm. And Bill Maher was asking John Cleese what he thought about his fans. And he said something kind of revealing that I never heard anybody say before. He said, oh, they're idiotic. <laughs> you know his accent. He says, they come up to me and say, oh, you are so wonderful. And how can I be wonderful like you? And, you know, screw off. And and I don't feel like that about my fans. I really like when okay. people... <laughs> I didn't know where you were going with that. but yeah. well, I mean, I, I like when people call me and appreciate me. But yeah. he does have a point. And the point is... Mm -hmm. There's something of an expression of narcissism in the fan, in the fan relationship. Mm -hmm. Like you, your fans are not necessarily your friends. They they need you to be perfect in many ways, and they want you to validate them as perfect. And it's difficult for most of them to go beyond that. What I so I, you know, I feel happy when people say, "Oh, Glenn, I've been listening to all your tapes, and it means so much to me." and I really genuinely do feel happy that I'm making a difference in their life. But what I really like is when someone actually does the work. Right. When some, you know, you interviewed Ryan Levesque a while back, yeah. and he worked with me intensively for several years, and he's built a multi-million-dollar agency based in, in large part on the philosophies that I taught him. He made it his own and developed his own method, and he deserves full credit for that. But that that makes me really proud. Yeah. That that makes me really happy, and when I think about the f not only how his family will do better but how mm -hmm. the families of the people that he works with will do better and you know all the wheels of e-commerce that are spinning because you know i helped him light that spark yeah. he, he he kept fanning the flames and he deserves full credit yeah. but i did help him light that spark he mentions and, you a lot yes for sure it gives you a lot of credit yeah yeah so so that's when i feel genuinely happy and those people are because of the nature of marketing reality and the nature of business reality, those people are too few and far between. There, you know, there are a few dozen of them that really light my fire. Mm -hmm. um, and they make the whole thing worthwhile. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, when you teach marketing, mostly what you're selling is hope. And, you know, I I I tend to exaggerate a lot less than everybody else and I tend to tell the ugly truth a lot more than everybody else and so I give people a little less hope than everybody else but my kind of people mm -hmm. feel more hopeful from that kind of message because right. um, they feel like we're cutting through the clutter and they, they know what to do. But even so, mm -hmm. the 80-20 rule applies to implementation in every market and only 20% of the people are really going to try to implement anything significant and only 20% of those people are going to carry it through to the end. And mm -hmm. and so those are the people that really inspire me or the people that carry it through to the end. And if any of my fans are listening and you really want to inspire me, then... Do you know, something. Yeah, do, do, do something. Right. Make a difference. Even if you go out and fail, just keep doing it because you'll mm -hmm. succeed eventually. And then write me a note and tell me about it. That's, mm -hmm. that, that's what inspires me. Dr. Glenn, I appreciate your time. Unfortunately, I don't have uh, time for Ryan's question that he gave me, but um, I want to hear where should people go to check you out? And I mean, when I researched you, which I do a lot of, there's, I think you own and operate about 50 different websites or I don't even know how many, but where should people check out? Well, they're, they're, they're two primary ones. Mm -hmm. And my primary focus these days is really on the coaching academy. And, mm -hmm. and if you'd like to check that out, you would start at thecoachingtest.com, mm -hmm. thecoachingtest.com, and that, that'll that give you a custom analysis of your strengths and weaknesses in the mm -hmm. coaching field. Yeah. Um, and I would say the audience for this podcast would probably be more interested in the business side of that. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the great things about the possibility of becoming a business coach is you can, there, there are a lot of people out there who are really genuinely knowledgeable about marketing and advertising, but they haven't been able to put together the whole business. There's so much to running a business. And right. sometimes being a coach is really the business for them. So 
that's that's probably the best place to start. Okay. Um, or I have a marketing blog at glennlivingston.com if you're interested mm-hmm. in that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Too. Great. Dr. Glenn, it's been an absolute pleasure. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jeremy. It was fun to talk to you. It's been a pleasure.